All right, all right. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? We're here to talk about EVO. Biggest fighting game tournament of the year continues growing and growing and growing. Street Fighter actually apparently uh, had 70,000 more views. The largest, biggest growth in terms of viewership was definitely Street Fighter 4. had 70,000 more views than it did last year, so kudos to them. I'm going to run through each game kind of more or less in... Uh, order of when they were actually on stream because I kind of wrote down no, I didn't write down a lot of stuff but just you know kind of certain things that happened throughout the weekend um so it's kind of going to be an order of when the games were actually played and so I also did um grab a couple some information one of them somebody posted uh the amount of viewers of each game that was on the EVO main stage and ironically and I guess this is kind of indicative of how Persona 4 Arena was kind of treated they don't the numbers for Persona 4 Arena aren't even included. Like Persona 4 Arena is not even mentioned on this list. So that's a little sad. But that being said, I greatly enjoyed Persona 4 Arena personally. Uh I did not see the pools for it, but I did watch Top 8 and the very first match that happened in Top 8 was I believe uh Cho KSB Cho his Ken against Soji's Teddy. I believe that what it, that's what it was. It might have been Hagiwara's Teddy. I remember it was against a Teddy, but I can't remember specifically which it was. But anyway, point being, the moment I saw Cho playing how strong his kin was, how dominating his kin was, I just looked at that and I said, you know what, man? I tweeted it. Ken's got, Ken's got this in the bag. Ken won Evo. I didn't even need to see the rest of the matches to know that Ken was going to win EVO. And he did. And not only did he win EVO, he dominated EVO. He, I do not believe he lost a single match. Not just, you know, oh, he dropped, uh, you know, he went 2-1 or 3-2 against these. No, he went 2-0, 2-0, 2-0, 3-0 against everybody that he ran into. He killed that tournament. So congratulations to him showing off the strength of Ken. Uh, on top of that, you know, gotta give my special shout out to Koichi. His Aegis was very, very impressive. I have never seen anybody manage Orgia Meter as well as he did. That was incredibly impressive to watch. Just how, like, he would have, you couldn't even see the meter that was left, but he knew the precise moment to end it right before it ran out. He maximized the potential of Orgia meter and that was really really impressive not to say none of the other players were impressive because we all know Tahichi is uh, he's the highest ranked uh, player in Japanese arcades we had Okusan who I also have to give a special shout out to for ruining my day because <laughs> for those of you that do not know a lot about me you may not know my experience with Persona Ken was the first character I ever made and right away I recognized that character's strengths I saw what he was capable of saw how amazing he was immediately threw him on, on my t personal top five list however he also bored me to tears <laughs> he is a very oppressive character once he catches you he doesn't really ever let you go but he's still just very very boring to me so after that i went through some other pl uh, characters and eventually i settled on show and that's what leads us to okusan Sh okusan is basically the only high level show player that i have personally seen so whenever i looked at stuff you know when you're trying to learn a character, a lot of the times you often search out players that are better than you to see their methods, see what they do to try to incorporate it into your own gameplay. And so Okusan is somebody I am very familiar with and I was hoping, you know, would make it far because I want to see him go far with Sho. And then he loses the very first round, uh, the first match that he was up against, against uh, whoever, I can't remember exactly who he was playing. But he lost the very first match, and he switched to Minazuki. And I was like, you know what? I hope you lose now. And he did. So I got to give him a special shout-out for being a traitor to show, switching to the one that has the persona. Should have gone persona list the entire time. Just saying. That being said, uh, the, I saw the viewership, the maximum of viewership that I saw for Persona 4 Arena was 40,000 viewers, which is the lowest for EVO, unfortunately. Uh, up... The second lowest was Killer Instinct. Actually, no, I'm sorry. I apologize. That was incorrect. Tekken 7 was the second lowest with 55,000. Killer Instinct was the third lowest with 66,000. I s switched those up. But either way, I mean, I still... I don't really think that means a significant amount, really. Because I think any game 
that would have been featured on Sunday would have reached about, I mean, regardless of when it was, what game it was, I think it would have reached Guilty Gear numbers, which was around 120,000 people. Uh, I think if it was, like I said, if it was on Sunday instead of Friday or Saturday, then those games would have reached those numbers. It's just because they were not. Unfortunately, they got lower viewership and, you know, suffered because a lot of other stuff was going on at the same time. So, you know, you may have had 60,000 people on stream one, 30,000 people on stream two, 20,000 people on stream three. You know, there were, I think, seven, maybe eight streams going at the same time, plus side tournament streams. So there was a lot of split, you know, viewership, whereas on Sunday, there's only one stream going down. You got one stream to watch, so everybody's watching that stream. Um, so I do feel like, you know, it not really, it's not indicative of, like, the hype those games bring or anything necessarily, more so that it's just people, a lot of people just tuned in for all of Sunday that maybe they didn't really care about Guilty Gear, maybe they didn't care about Mortal Kombat, maybe they didn't care about Smash, but they were just watching all Sunday because you know what, they're there for the Evo hype. And so I feel like, you know, any of those games would have reached similar, if not better, numbers had they been featured on Sunday instead of Saturday. That being said, let's move right along. Smash was the highest viewed game, uh, Smash 4, because it had its finals on Saturday. Up until Sunday, they very, I saw, I did not see them get above 100,000, but I saw them get remarkably close. Personally, I saw it around 98,000, that's what I listed it as. This guy has Smash at 97,000. It was so close, and I was really hoping they were going to hit it. Because, you know, hitting hey, hitting six figures of viewers, that's really that's great. That's fantastic. Especially, like I said, on a Saturday rather than on finals day when you have, you know, plenty of other people on other streams. I, unfortunately, I did not watch Smash. I also did not watch Tekken. I don't understand Tekken at all. I don't really dig 3D games. I also didn't watch Killer Instinct. So I don't really have any commentary regarding those. Top 16 of Guilty Gear. That's when I started tuning into Guilty Gear, and unfortunately, one my one major complaint is FAB. Now, number one, it was a very big surprise that he didn't make top eight. And so, you know, I'm sitting there wondering, who beat this guy? Because as far as I'm aware, he was on stream. I know he was on stream once for top 16. I don't know about prior to that. But he was only on stream once within, I, I don't want to say I only watched top 16. I watched like top 128 or something like that. He was on stream once. And he got beaten by Zidane, I believe, in top 32. I believe Zidane beat him. Then he had to win one more match after that in order to get into top 8. How was that match not streamed? And I understand, you know, when it comes to a even just a normal tournament, there's no possible way, unless you want to make that tournament run for way longer than it has to, to stream every single match. It's impossible. Then you throw in a 1,000-plus players... There is no way in hell you're even going to get to stream half of those matches. So a lot of matches are going to be missed. That being said, Ogawa got all of the attention. And, I mean, let's be honest. Ogawa is Ogawa. He won the tournament. Nobody would have bet against him winning the tournament. He steamrolled almost everybody in his way up until top 8, where some players started to give him some trouble, which I will speak about a little bit later. But... Ultimately, Ogawa just curb stomped everybody that stepped to him. So, but they're constantly streaming these matches, which again, they're just they kind they don't really have hype because it's like you're watching the juggernaut just walk through, you know, the little peons in his path that have no chance. Meanwhile, off to the side, you have FAB against Zidane, one of Japan's best against, in my opinion, America's best. One of them is gone. One of them is now going to be out of this tournament. And that doesn't get streamed? And then just think about the hype of what, you know, what would the hype that would have been brought to the stream for Zidane beating FAB. That would have been amazing. I would have loved to see that. And unfortunately, it was not streamed. Instead, we got Ogawa against, you know, Ogawa victim number 17. <laughs> And that really, that irritates me to an incredible degree. I really, I feel like whoever was deciding what matches went on stream didn't really know Guilty Gear, didn't know the scene, and was just told like, yo, give Ogawa attention, give Nage attention, give uh, Nakamura attention, or something like that. Probably just, you know what, make sure Ogawa gets all the attention, because that's who people want to see. And that's what they did. And I, I don't know, like I said, I don't know if that's how it happened, but I just, it's unbelievable to me that a match like FAB versus Zidane would not have been something that pe everybody would have been like, yo, put that on stream. Get that on stream. Are you kidding me? That has to be streamed. 
So, unfortunately that happened, but still, very, very good Guilty Gear gameplay overall. I was surprised to see Dogura there actually rocking Sin, because last time I saw him, he was just a soul main. Uh, congratulations to him, obviously, for making top 8. He was proving himself to be a master of numerous games. He got pretty far in Street Fighter as well with Relento. Uh, so yeah, kudos to him. And it was exciting to see him playing Sin because Sin is the my favorite character in that. Well, Chip is my favorite character in that game. Sin follows Chip, but nobody really plays Chip. There's like two Chip players that I know of. Not very many of them. The one thing that really did surprise you know what I'll talk about when I get to top eight. Let's continue on around here. I was really surprised with Marvel. I was very surprised with how low the viewership was for... I mean, obviously, I don't want to get into that whole, Oh, Marvel's dead. I don't care about that whole thing. Marvel's going to live because it's a Capcom game. Pure and simple. Like, I know what that sounds like, but Marvel is Marvel. It's its own entity. Like, it's gonna it's gonna keep being played. It's gonna keep receiving numbers. Maybe not the numbers it once reached. There may be not numbers that are gonna be even moderately comparative to what Street Fighter can draw in, but it's still going to be higher than most games. Pure and simple. So uh, I don't I'm, like I'm not trying to say to get into that, but I really actually was surprised that you know you look over and you see Street Fighter at 8 a.m. in the morning, and for me 8 a.m. Pacific time getting 60,000 plus views eventually climbing up to like the 80,000s for pools and then to see uh, Marvel it's top 256 not even just necessarily pools but it's top 256 it's quarterfinals semifinals only hitting like 25,000 viewers and then eventually you know like the road to top 8 finally got it to uh, the 40,000s which again that was remarkably I was really surprised how low the viewership was for that game uh, one thing that I did kind of, I'll get into it in a little bit, uh, again, when I talk about top eight, because I do have, a, I want to pose a question and get your thoughts in regard to the matter, see if, you know, maybe you think differently than me. What, you know, just what the general opinion is of what I think about Marvel and how it resulted, what ended up going on. But Chris G, I don't know how many of you guys caught the match of Cross against Chris G. Cross is considered Japan's best player, and he blew up Chris G. He beat him pretty well. He is very... The one thing that really stood out is how incredibly well Cross was capable of navigating past Morgan's fireball game, where he almost never even took chip damage. Like, let alone getting hit, he just almost didn't even get hit by the fireballs ever. Didn't block them, was just bypassing the fireballs, missiles, everything. Chris G did not stand a chance until he finally actually st started going in and was running, you know, flight cancel S mix up. Uh, on him and stuff like that but uh, up until that point cross was just dominating the match but one thing which again i'll get into i'll expand on my reasoning for further chris g looked terrible not his gameplay but just his whatever was going on his mood because there was a moment i cannot believe that you know somebody that was running the tournament some kind of evo judge did not come up to him and be like dude we got to get this rolling like come on man every single time between matches he took upwards of like two minutes to finally restart the match i mean like cross was you know kind of trying to urge him on like yo dude what are you doing let's go and he just sat there you know head in hands trying to just like delay as much time as possible i mean if i didn't know any better i would have thought the dude was dying it looked ridiculously awkward it was ridiculously awkward and clearly that guy is just either he was playing some really dumb mind games or he was just all kinds of fucked in the head. I don't know what was going on. All that I know is I was just sitting there along with, I'm sure, everybody going, What the hell <laughs> is this? But anyway, that's the end of my Saturday stuff. Because like I said, uh, Killer Instinct and Mortal Kombat. Well, Marvel Finals, Killer Instinct, or Marvel Semifinals, and then Killer Instinct Finals and Mortal Kombat Semifinals were the big kind of highlights of Saturday. And I was not interested in the latter two, and I only kind of slightly paid attention to Marvel. So, we're moving right on to Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday. Very hype. Guilty Gear continuing the anime hype. Last year, Blaze Blue was a highlight of Evo. Let's be honest, man. Blaze Blue had a ridiculously hype top eight. Absolutely, like, I wish it had exploded more than it actually did but guilty gear did it again man and you know what the one of the big things 
was actually the obvious Woshige moment, which, you know, anybody that's going to talk about evil got to talk about the Woshige moment. What are you standing up for? For those of you that may have missed it, Woshige was in the middle of a match with Ogawa. It was 1-1 at the time. Both players had a round. Or no, not both players had a round. Ogawa had a round. Woshige thought he had a round. So he won the round against Ogawa, and he thought he had taken the match. He thought he had won. He stood up. He started celebrating. He was very clearly, you know, kind of overwhelmed with, oh, man, I just beat Ogawa. This is Ogawa. This is the guy that everybody just said was a sure victor. No chance anybody was going to beat him. Ogawa had this free. And he thought he had won. And he stood up. He was celebrating. He was very emotional about it. What? You know, everybody watching was like, what is he doing? Does he, he knows that he's on, it's 1-1, right? Like, he knows that this match isn't over. And he didn't. He didn't get back into his chair in time. The match started up. Ogawa immediately clocked him with, you know, an optimal starter. Fit, got 50% damage right out the gate. Uh, and then he, well, Shige didn't block the follow-up. He got stunned and he got killed just like that. It took 10 seconds. 10 seconds going from, you know, celebratory thinking you just beat the Guilty Gear God to just utter devastation. And that's the kind of moment which it doesn't matter what the game is. It doesn't matter what it's about. It doesn't matter if you don't understand what's happening on screen. You understand that emotion. It's something that transcends the game itself and can bring attention to the game where it's like, now people see this anguish, right? This mo this incredible moment, which you gotta feel for Wushige for. It's obviously entirely his fault. He has nobody to blame for that but himself, but it is still heartbreaking. And he became a fan favorite after that, too. Everybody was cheering for him because they wanted to see the Wushige Ogawa run back. Um, but still, having that kind of thing happen is the kind of thing where anybody can look at that. You understand the emotion. You understand the moment, even if you don't understand the game. And then because of that, it can bring attention to the game itself. Because people want to know what caused that particular event to happen. So now they see Guilty Gear, or, you know, they're... They see this moment, which is being spread to all, you know, media's covering it. It's all over Twitter. It's all over any kind of social media. It's bringing attention to this thing that a lot of people prior to that really had no reason to care about. And now they see Guilty Gear. Now a lot of people, you know, maybe a lot of people, well, not maybe, a lot of people are just going to see that and be like, oh, that really sucks for that guy. All right, moving on with my day. However, some people are going to stick around and go, wow, this game actually looks really interesting. Let me see the rest of Guilty Gear here. And maybe it draws, you know, some more fans in. Maybe it draws some more, uh, maybe it increases, you know, the numbers in the community, which is only a good thing to happen. And it's actually, that happened to me specifically. Well, not really, but I actually ended up getting drawn into Melee for the same reason, which I will get into. But first, we gotta talk about Mortal Kombat. Well, let's continue talking about the rest of Guilty Gear. So obviously, Ogawa did end up winning. What a shocker. But still, congratulations to him, and Ogawa versus Nage was still a very good match. I think anybody would have thought, you know, seeing everybody that's around, they're gonna be the top two. Like, I, I would have called that... I'm pretty sure anybody else would have called that the probable top two were going to be Ogawa and Nage. Because they both play incredibly strong characters and they're both the masters of their characters. Uh, third place was aforementioned Woshige. Nakamura was fourth. Both of them showing off the strength of Milia. Dogura got fifth with Sin, who is a surprise for me. I would not have called that because I've never really seen him have a particular presence in Guilty Gear. Like, he's... Or in Xard, anyway. I know a lot of people considered him the premier Robokai prior to Xard, but he hasn't really had a presence uh, in that game until now. So it was really cool to see him in top five. Uh, Ryan, who is basically the master of Kai. Then Mr. Kit Kat, who I believe is Shuto, something like that, bringing Axel to top eight. I would not have called that. And that's the other surprise. Zidane was, uh, Zidane's not the other. Well, he is kind of a surprise. But Zidane's, in my opinion, he's the best American Guilty Gear player. If anybody was going to make top eight against these Guilty Gear, these Japanese gods of Guilty Gear, it would have been Zidane. He did make it. Unfortunately, he lost right out the gate. Sadly. So he got seventh place. Uh, but yeah, really, I did not imagine Axel making top eight. I know he did get buffed in the 1.1 patch, but still, he was never... I've never really seen him play, period. And the one thing that really did surprise me, a complete and utter lack of El Felt. Because you know, I mean, you know, a lot, the commentators, uh, one of the matches that, one of the first matches that I saw of Guilty Gear 
was Nage against Nerd Josh. Nage's Faust against Nerd Josh's Elfeld. And they were very, the commentators seemed really surprised that every single time Nerd Josh got a hit on Nage, if Nage had a burst, he burst immediately. Just without hesitation, he burst. And they were like, why is he bursting so fast? And it just kind of, I really didn't understand why they were questioning it. Because Nage knows El Felt is a ridiculous character. She is incredibly strong. She did get nerfed a little bit from 1.0 to 1.1, but not a lot. They kind of nerfed her neutral, but her pressure was still basically the same. And like that is a character that you do not want to get hit by. And it really shows how much Nage respects that character, not even necessarily the player. Not to say Nerd Josh isn't worth respecting. He's a very good uh, player, but I've never really considered him like a top tier threat. He's always kind of been like a gatekeeper element in every game he's played where like he's really good but he's not good enough to really break into like a a video a, a tournament finals kind of a level if that makes any sense but still that's just how strong El Felt is where Nage you know just gets touched and he bursts immediately just get off me no we're going back to neutral you don't get to put me you don't get to knock me down and run your mix up fuck that um and so that really surprised me to not see an Elfelt in top 8. So I just wanted to run through that real quick for Guilty Gear. Moving on to Mortal Kombat. 180,000 viewers. That was the high, obviously the highest that I had seen. And I was very surprised. I didn't. Th I would not have called Mortal Kombat getting quite that high. 180,000 viewers. Actually, I think it got closer to 190,000. I believe 188,000 was the max. Kudos to them. I didn't really watch it myself because I've kind of drifted away from Mortal Kombat. I did end up catching, I think, around top four or five, something like that. I watched, like, the third to live. I tuned in. I started watching around the time that Sonic Fox was uh, playing against who? Who? I think it was MIT, maybe? Maybe it was Ketchup. I believe it was MIT. Yeah, because Sonic Fox knocked out both of the Yomi dudes, right? I believe Sonic Fox knocked both of them out. So I believe I saw him... Because I saw Sonic Fox against somebody, and then I saw the winner's finals of Foxy Grandpa and Honey Bee, and then I saw loser's finals of Sonic Fox and Honey Bee, and then I saw the winner's finals. Um, kudos to Sonic Fox, dude. Like, I mean, again, that's he's kind of a favorite when it comes to NRS tournaments. I believe, uh, if my information is not completely false, he has not lost an Injustice tournament in, like, years. He's just won every single Injustice event that he has been in. Um, and so, because of that, you know, obviously, you know, he's a very strong player. He's a very good player. But the thing that really amused me about it, about the Grand Finals, was you see Foxy Grandpa and Sonic Fox kind of going back and forth. Uh, Sonic Fox is using Katana. Foxy Grandpa using Kung Lao. Again, they're going back and forth. Foxy Grandpa looked like he kind of had the edge. And he ended up resetting the bracket. Kudos to him. Looked like he was going to make a really good match out of it. And then Sonic Fox switched to Aaron Black and just destroyed him. Just tore him apart, gave him the business, and sent him packing in rapid fashion. It was not even a fight at that point once Sonic Fox pulled out Aaron Black. Which, I mean, honestly, I think Aaron Black is one of the strongest characters in that game. I know there's a lot of debate surrounding who people think is the best. But personally, I believe Aaron Black is definitely up there. Uh, in terms of character viability, character strength is what he's capable of. And Sonic Fox tore that tournament apart the moment he chose Aaron Black. He killed it. So kudos to him again. Kudos to Mortal Kombat for getting 180,000 viewers. So let's move on to Smash. They hit 200k. The first game of the evening to hit 200,000 viewers. Kudos to Melee. Kudos, and that's just to go off on a little bit of a tangent real quick. That's something I've wondered. Uh, about whether or not any other community could do that because obviously we know how outspoken I am in regard to Arc System Works kind of you know release date and I've kind of sat down and thought like what would happen if the community just sat down and was like you know what man we hear you we understand that you're going to release more games but you know what we dig CP 1.1 and we're sticking with that version fuck the rest of them and, you know, just to see, you know, what would happen? What would occur if another community were to do that? Because Melee is the only one that's done that. Obviously, there's still people who play games like Third Strike or games like uh, Marvel 2, Street Fighter Alpha. There are plenty of, you know, small, tight-knit communities that still play those older games. But none have, you know, 
attained just the level of consistent competitiveness that Melee has managed to maintain for as long as it's been out. And, you know, honestly, I th- personally, I think Smash is the biggest fighting game kind of community that is out there. And the reason why I say that is because they have significantly more high-level sponsorships behind them. They were, I believe, the first fighting game to be put into esports in general from the get-go. And obviously, number one, it has the biggest casual fan base of any other fighting game. So, like, no matter what, people are going to be interested in Smash because Smash is... Smash is Smash. Smash is Nintendo. And, you know, they're going to have a huge viewership. So, because, because of all those elements, I really do feel, even if Street Fighter may kind of have, like, a larger tournament community smash has the bigger overall community if that makes any kind of sense and the more involved one and again i feel like they have uh better and more involved sponsors in that community than street fighter does so cool i mean i just i have to give a shout out to that community for sticking with melee keeping it on you know the attention on it just it's really an amazing thing to see and like i said even i got involved in it because the same thing as Woshige, you know you may not understand what's going on on screen, but you understand player emotion. And the reason why I initially kind of sat up and started paying attention and really actually started uh, watching top three was because I saw Hungry Box against PPMD. And Hungry Box's kind of edge control, his ability to just, you know, kind of kick somebody away from the edge and keep them from that edge, you know, remove all of their options and just make it so they can't do anything but fall to their death. Even if they may not have lost a lot of life, you know, they're hanging around like 40%, 50%, but he still, he keeps them from getting back to that edge. And so I can kind of understand how players can see that and kind of be like, man, I did not lose this legitimately. This is some cheap ass shit. And then the salt starts flowing. And that's what I saw. I saw the salt start flowing with PPMD. And I was like, oh, let me sit up and watch this. Am I going to see some, am I going to see some rage right now? It looks like I might. Uh, He did keep his cool. Well, he didn't really I don't want to say he kept his cool because he did end up losing, but uh, he definitely, there was no, you know, like, outrage. There was no salt. He didn't, you know, stand up and smack Hungry Box in the face and walk away. He was very collected about it, but you could still see just the agitation on his face, and that's what caused me to begin watching it. And it was very, it was a very exciting grand finals. Uh, Armada, I believe, was the top placer. Very, very good. He was a very good player. Kudos to him. He deserved it. But... Then it hit the award ceremony, and let me tell you, there was a player, again, I don't know a lot about the Smash community, but it's very clear that a lot of people had high expectations for a player called Mango. Uh, and, like, initially, people were thinking he was so salty that he wasn't even going to show up to, like, the award ceremony thing that they had uh, at, at the end. Can we also talk about, real quick, how amusing it is <laughs> that the Smash Top 3 got golden sticks? <laughs> Like, these people that... They probably don't even work on, like, the Wii, the GameCube, nothing. But they still got the golden sticks. That kind of amused me that, like, I, I would have personally tried to kind of find something that I might tailor more to the Smash community than actually giving, you know, than giving them a golden stick. But still, the golden stick is an awesome thing to have. Like, I would certainly... If I had placed top three in Smash and I got the golden stick, I would certainly not complain about getting it. Because that is a beautiful goddamn device. But it's still kind of amusing that, you know, these people that have probably never used or owned a fighting stick in their lives. Congratulations, you now got a golden fighting stick. It'll be a wonderful, you know, ornament of some kind to be placed on, you know, a shelf or a trophy case or something like that. Congratulations. But anyway, back to Mango. This dude, when he was given his medal, took it and tossed it. He just threw it. Gone. Medal gone. Can we talk about how much of a bitch it takes to do something like that? I realize I'm calling people out. I don't particularly enjoy... uh, You know, I'm not sitting here trying to like, yo, I gotta start drama over this because people will pay attention to me. No, that's just a bitch move. And bitch moves should be called out appropriately. Like, if the event had fucked you over in some way, like, they changed the version on you, which obviously can't happen with Melee. There's only one version of Melee. But... You know, let's just say something fucked up happens. Like, actually, what happened at SoCal Regionals with Street Fighter, where they realized they were playing an unpatched version of the game, and that actually cost uh, Kazunoko his match. Like, he had to replay his match, and he ended up losing, because he had previously won in incorrect circumstances. 
And something like that, I would be pissed at the event for. I would be salty. I would be angry. That would not be something that would sit well with me. Nothing extra. Nothing happened on the side at EVO to cause this dude distress. This guy lost under his own power. The loss was entirely his fault. I get being mad at a loss, but completely backhanding the event that is being held to showcase your skills and is giving you an enormous opportunity that honestly is basically unheard of anywhere else. That's just how big EVO is. To just backhand it and disrespect it like that that is an enti- huge bitch move and so again i don't know anything about the smash community i don't know how beloved mango is right now all that i know is mango is a huge gigantic douchebag just throwing that out there moving on marvel so marvel was mm, i i don't so obviously one of the big stories of marvel top eight was without any of the so-called Marvel gods, which are considered F-Champ, J-Wong, and Chris G. And so this is where my earlier comments about Chris G kind of tie in, and they kind of tie in with Justin Wong and F-Champ as well. Obviously, everybody knows Chris G kind of just disappeared for a while, right? Like, he was just gone. Nobody really knew where he was, what he was doing. Then he came back sponsored by Tempo Storm, but he never really reached the same level of kind of ability that he previously had. He never really reached... Uh, the di- kind of, you know, how much of a danger he was in tournament as he used to be. And so, F Champ, I don't even know where that guy went. Like, I have not seen that dude at any majors. I have not seen him involved in anything for a very, very long time. So, it's entirely probable he's very out of practice. And Justin Wong even said himself, like, he doesn't focus Marvel anymore. He plays it occasionally, but. He's done everything there is to do now. He doesn't need to prove himself as, you know, this dominating force for years and years to come. He won EVO. He did what he wanted to do with Marvel. And so now he's focusing on SF4 because of Capcom Cup. Like, Capcom Cup is the big thing now. If you want to make it as a fighting game player, if you want to make it based off of... You know, if you want to make a job, a living out of being a fighting game player, Capcom Cup is currently where it's at for 2D fighters. And so he's focused on Street Fighter. He doesn't really focus on Marvel. So that is where my question comes in here. Is that do you really think... Because Kane Blue River obviously put a lot of stock in beating Justin Wong in that tournament. And that's kind of, you know, the thing that you have to kind of question. Is it's like, this isn't Justin Wong at the height of his potential. This is a Justin Wong that is still obviously very good, very dangerous. But he's not the killer that he used to be. And so obviously, you know, Kane Blue River just won Evo. Nobody can take that away from him. I'm certainly not trying to say like, oh, he didn't fucking deserve it. He won it. Fair and square. Ray Ray's a very strong player. Apology Man is a very strong player. Like, he, it's not like he just got there for free and it shouldn't really count. He beat a lot of very strong players and made a very good showing of himself. But that's my question. It's kind of like, does it really... Can you really qualify him as being on the same level as the people that have won Evo prior to this... Or do you really think that maybe that a lot of the competitiveness surrounding Marvel has kind of fallen off and a lot of people that used to be dire threats really just don't care about it anymore? Same thing with, you know, people like PR Rog, obviously. He was always a tournament force to be reckoned with. I don't even know if he plays Marvel anymore. Um, so that, I just wanted to throw that out there as kind of a consideration, see what you thought about it. But still... Nobody can take that away from him. Unfortunately, there was more awkwardness with that whole microphone situation. Hey, can I have the microphone so I can say something? I know a lot of people gave Evo Mr. Wizard shit over saying, no, we can't do that. But you have to understand, now some of this kind of falls into the slippery slope fallacy whole deal of that where you're kind of thinking, oh, it starts off with this, but then people start making, you know, Grammy acceptance speeches to celebrate their wins or something. But really, it ultimately comes down to the fact that, like, you either can just stone cold enforce, no, absolutely not, you cannot do this, it's against our rules, we are on a schedule and we can't be having you hampering that schedule by taking up time. Now obviously there was plenty of time uh, in between things, but they had to, you know, they had to prepare the stage for the Street Fighter announcement, stuff like that. You know, they had a lot to do and they have a lot going on. It's a very high pressure situation for the tournament organizers. And so you have to understand it from their side of things where, you know, they got shit to do. You don't need to do this. You can make your shout out on Twitter or something. You don't need to be doing this. You don't need to be creating this scenario. And 
ultimately, it's a really kind of self-entitled, self-important kind of thing to basically say, what I have to say is more important than this event. Can I please have a microphone? And then to be told, no, you can't. Not right, dude. Sorry, we can't do it. We got shit to do. And then to say, oh, okay, well, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to say it anyway. That... Eh, I'm really on the fence on that one. Like, obviously, it didn't actually impact anything. It didn't exactly ruin the event. But it's still, it's kind of the same thing as, you know, Mango, you're kind of just disrespecting the event by putting yourself above it, I guess. It's kind of, I mean, I, again, and what he said was a very good thing to say. I really, I agree with what he said. I'm not trying to be like, yo, you should never have done that and you should be ashamed of yourself. But I, I do think it was a little over the top and unnecessary and kind of disrespectful to, again, to the tournament which is giving you this opportunity in the first place. That being said, again, congratulations to him. Nobody can take that win away from him. Uh, so moving on past Marvel. Street Fight Horror. Obviously the big story, it hit 230,000 viewers on uh, Twitch.tv. Who knows how many it reached in you know foreign communities like Nico Nico. I know obviously there were other streams and other languages that other people were watching. And... Um, you know, I'm really curious to know, because the thing that I was hoping for at the very beginning, my fingers crossed, I hope this happens, 250,000 viewers. That is what I really wanted to see. My kind of basis is like, we have really, truly risen to a new level as a community, as, you know, just this fighting game in general. This will be awesome to see. And unfortunately, it didn't reach that on Twitch, but I think if you count worldwide, I believe it did it would have hit around 250,000 because Mike Ross actually tweeted out uh, at some point in time around kind of like top five that there were 230,000 viewers currently watching and he didn't specify on Twitch and that was the thing you know I, I was keeping track of it myself and when he tweeted that at the time Twitch was at 210,000 so I have to imagine there were plenty of more international views going on and I think if you combined all those together it would have eclipsed 250,000 but unfortunately, it didn't reach quite that high for Twitch itself, which was a shame, because I really wanted to see that. Apparently, actually, there was a Riot Games thing going on at the same time. I don't know if it was another tournament or like some kind of announcement, but if you look at the Twitch TV stats, there was a Riot Games something going on, which I think had like 600,000 views at the time. <laughs> so that kind of hurts a little bit, but that's how, that's how League of Legends is. Like, I believe the biggest League of Legends tournament of last year had over a million people watching it so that league of legends is in part in the kind of not really pun or whatever it was in a, a league of its own and uh in regard to kind of stream viewership and all that because even then like random people streaming league of legends can beat out like the average numbers for fighting game majors which I mean, that's you know it kind of hurts to see that to see kind of you know the le what the level of I don't know, kind of the scope of what the stream is and how the League of Legends stream is just like, yo, blowing everybody else out of the water easily without issue versus, you know, this thing which people have put their blood, sweat, and tears into, you know, Spooky basically doing everything he can as a human being to, uh, grow, str to grow streams and make fighting games a force to be reckoned with and then, you know, to see it beaten out by, you know, just some guy playing League of Legends, that hurts a little bit. That kind of hurts the soul but that being said still it had by far the most views of any fighting game anything prior to this so kudos to them for that can't take it away from them the will continue to grow i really hope that capcom pro tour and eventually capcom cup ends up doing even better uh if they continue you know if sony and capcom continue throwing their full support behind these events i think you know we're really headed to a place where you may even be able to compete with some of the major esports. Who knows? Cross your fucking fingers, because that's really what I hope for. But anyway, Street fights her for obviously the biggest story. I, I, the jury player, which I, I'm very excited to see. Again, same kind of thing with uh, that I mentioned in Persona 4 Arena. I used to play Jury. Jury is definitely one of the characters that I like the most in the Street Fighter 4 cast. And if I actively played the game, and if I was good enough to handle charging the fireballs and keeping them charged while also maintaining neutral presence and blah blah blah. I would definitely play her. But that's that's a lot of effort to put in for a game that I don't take incredibly seriously. But still, Jury is one of my favorite characters. 
to, so to see her get that level of attention, unfortunately, I believe II went 0 and 2 in top eight, which is a big shame. But he still, he gave Nemo one hell of a fight. He almost had it, and I wish he had taken it. Uh, but even then, later on, Infiltration ended up actually using Jury and uh, making, you know, in, in, Infiltration was kind of amusing because he used against Gamer I can't remember if there were other characters, but he used Jury, or he used Chun, Jury, and Abel. All three of those characters are probably three of my favorite characters in the cast. The only way he probably could have beaten that was if he went with Makoto in there too, because I think I like Makoto more than I like Abel. But <laughs> it's still funny to see Infiltration pick these three characters, which are easily some of my favorite characters in the game. So that was that alone kind of made top eight for me, seeing all these characters that are really just you know on the top of my list for favorite characters to watch, favorite characters to play. So that was really cool for me personally. Unfortunately, I was really surprised that Tokido ended up losing as soon as he did. I really thought Tokido... He started in a winner's bracket, I believe. And I think he also went 0-2. I think II and Tokido both went 0-2. And, and that really surprised me. Because from what I had seen at Tokido, I thought he was looking unstoppable. I thought he was going to... I He was my choice to win the event. I thought he was going to win. And to see him go out the way he did was very surprising. However... That led us to the match of PR Rog against Nemo. Unfortunately, PR Rog was not able to take it. He ended up falling to Relento, but PR Rog was playing out of his mind. I think the only, if one little thing was changed, if Balrog had an effective answer to the role, not even necessarily like just, you know, hitting him out of it, but just being able to punish it alone. Which some characters are capable of doing. Balrog is clearly not one of them because PR Rog never managed to do it. He tried a bunch of different things. Uh, if Balrog was capable of punishing that role, I think PR Rog would have won that. But unfortunately, he wasn't, so that gave Nemo license to use that role just constantly. Rolento's a really slippery character. He's really hard to hit. He has a lot of alternative options that you know you don't really have just one solution to all of these things. You got to basically pick and choose and hope you pick the right thing to fight what Relento ends up doing and unfortunately Balrog just did not have the answer to Relento and PR Rog lost that made me sad because that also ended up leading to II's downfall even though he made one hell of a fight of it it wasn't looking like he was going to but still he made one hell of a fight of it uh and I actually wrote down because later on obviously the infiltration uh versus Gamer B match happened there was 195,000 viewers at that point in time. And, you know, so obviously I'm sitting here getting excited. Like, oh, yes, please break 200,000. Please, let's do this. And then Infiltration picks Chun. Then he picks Cherry. Then he picks Abel. And I wrote down, oh, my fucking God, Infiltration, please be my waifu. Actually, that happened after he picked Jerry. He hadn't even picked Abel at that point. He just picked Jerry, and I was like, yes, Jerry, I love this character. Um, so that was super awesome. In the middle of that match, it ended up eclipsing 200,000 viewers. Fucking fantastic. And that set, Infiltration versus Gamer B, I know Gamer B has eaten a lot of uh, vitriol from that match because of how he played Elena, Elena's heel going on, all that stuff. A lot of people were not very appreciative of Elena during that match and of her heel, and they, a lot of them were like, oh, Gamer B is just this super cheap, douchebag for abusing Elena's heel like that. Infiltration played fair. Have you ever been in a fighting mo in any moment in your life where something was on the line and the result mattered to you? Ever? I will take every single advantage at my disposal to take a win. If it is if I am capable of it, I will do whatever the fuck it takes. To get that W. And it is ridiculous for people to be that judgmental. Especially over something that like that's not even... He's not even like... Abusing a glitch in the game or something. He's not doing... You know like people will cheer shit like the Quicksilver glitch in Marvel. Well, actually that got banned. But you know all the various glitches that are in Marvel. People will cheer that shit. And then you see somebody doing something like this where it's not even a glitch. It's just how the game was made. It's how Elena was created. Yes, heel makes Elena a ridiculously strong character in certain matchups. Because you saw, like, Chun really doesn't have an answer for it. Because Chun is not a high damage character. Versus when he picked Jury and he started running Jury, he made Gamer be scared to use that heel. Because Jury has a very significant damage output. If you give her the opportunity to get in and, you know, hit you with a normal fireball, normal spin kick, uh, 
that does some very strong damage, and he ended up not using heal anywhere near as much in that match because it was not anywhere near as safe. The bonus was not enough to really use it in the same fashion. Um, but still, just seeing that kind of reaction in general from the fighting game community, seeing, I mean, it's not a big one. There are plenty more people out there who have the same opinion as me who are like, yo, use the tools at your disposal. But just to see how much, like, just anger resulted from that is, oh man, it just was dumb to me. That being said, Gamer B ended up taking it. He went on to the grand finals to fight off, uh, to fight Momochi. Took the first one, and I wrote down after that first one, Roundhouse is going to be the Evo MVP. He took Adon's Roundhouse to the fullest extent of its power. But unfortunately, Roundhouse only gets you like 10% damage per hit. Evil Ryu gets you about 50%. I'm very sad, because obviously, everybody, if you don't remember, Momochi had a pocket jury for a long time. I don't know, actually, I don't think it was really even a pocket jury. I think he mained her for a while. And so I was really hoping, you know, I tweeted this out. Please stick with the flow of the top eight so far. Switch to jury and win Evo with her. And unfortunately, he didn't. He switched to Evil Ryu, which just, that makes me a little sad. Because nobody wanted Evil Ryu to win Evil Ryu to win Evo. Makes me super sad that he did that. But still, he played very, very well. Aside from the stick malfunction, Mike Ross stealing my shit again. We've been this be through this before, bro. I've got my eye on you. I know you stealing my content. <laughs> After the stick malfunction, I tweeted. I'm really hyping my Twitter up, aren't I? I tweeted at Monsieur's Spooky and Markman. Now would be a great time for a Mad Cats promo. And like five minutes later, Mike Ross tweets a Mad Cats promo. <laughs> you stealing my shit, dog. Nobody else could have thought of that but me. I got my eye on you, son. Not really. But still, weird timing. I'm just, I'm just saying. But still, again, congratulations to Momochi. It was a heartbreaking thing, though, to see uh, Gamer B's fiance up on the stage. She's crying. Parallels to uh, Dogura from last year. Same thing happened. Dogura ended up losing in an extended amazing match and there was no stick malfunction in that one but uh because nobody was using a razor stick hey yo um <laughs> uh but yeah dogura ended up losing in a, just a heartbreaking match really emotional one and his fiance did the same thing broke down was just crying over the loss and you got to understand it man like i know a lot of people kind of judge other people you know if they end up you know crying or getting emotional over the game but man you cannot understand how many emotions are just roiling through you when you're in that kind of scenario i've never even been on a stage that big before and i understand those emotions and what you go through mentally uh and when you're in that situation and it's just once it's all over you cannot hold that shit back it's not possible sometimes it just comes out and uh that's what happened so i mean congratulations to momochi he definitely he earned that shit. I don't know. I think anybody that went through a set that Infiltration and Gamer B went through, I don't think anybody can come out the other end of that and kind of, you know, succeed in another similarly pressured set. But he made a fight of it, and he almost won it. He came very, very close. Um, obviously, largely. A lot, you know, you never know if Momoshi would have ended up winning that last match 2-0 if the stick malfunction had not happened. But uh, Gamer B, last game, last round. Stick malfunction or not, it was a real fight. You know, it's not like Gamer B had, you know, the stick. It's not like the stick was breaking all throughout the grand finals and it finally just died, was finally put out of its misery at the last moment. It was a very real fight the entire way through. And so that could have gone either way. And I really think that just how much of an emotional toil that set versus infiltration was would have you know kind of taken anybody out of you know their best and so kudos to him for making a very real fight of it it was an amazing event my favorite evo so far even though like i said unfortunately i don't think persona 4 arena really got the uh kind of level of attention it deserved but that's i mean it's the biggest evo of all time you got all these participants you can't put everything in you can't i mean unless you want to start it like six in the morning and run it until midnight you can't it's not possible to uh manage to have all the games on one day but it's still it kind of 
it does irk me a bit that it was just kind of shoved off on Friday. Like, it wasn't even given a Saturday evening finals kind of a deal. Either way, I don't want to take that away from the whole event. It was an absolutely amazing event, phenomenal event. I can't wait for Capcom Cup at this point. And I can't wait to see what happens with, you know, continuing on with the fighting games in the future. And I really hope that this continued level of hype, this continued level of attention that the FGC gets whenever EVO rolls around really brings viewership of all the other major events that occur throughout the year and really makes it so that there's a very real audience out there for fighting games and you know just hopefully it just continues to grow cross your fingers and hope that happens because i will certainly be trying my best to bring hype and entertainment to the fighting game community so thank you for listening i am finally Audi. i have talked for long enough my throat is ridiculously dry peace out have a good day